All right. Well, it's 12.01. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. I'm Sarah Hanawald. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development with One Schoolhouse. And I'm joined by my partner in a crime here, Peter Gao. Peter, you want to say hello and tell everybody who you are? Hi, I'm Peter Gao. I'm the Independent Curriculum Resource Director at One Schoolhouse. And uh, before that, I, I spent a whole lot of time in a bunch of schools doing a lot of things, mostly having to do with educating kids. Well, we are thrilled to welcome Damien to this webinar. And Damien and I first met, um, I think by reputation, sort of reading things that each other had done and, and that sort of thing. And then we actually finally got to meet in person about a year ago at Laurel School, doing a workshop for a group of teachers on, I think we were talking about technology, but really we were talking about why school the big picture, right? What's the purpose of school? And as we sort of got into our conversation, I realized that I needed to, to find out more about Damien's work and then his research into fidelity to mission and how do we know we're doing what we say we're doing is spot on for this time in, our, in the life cycle of our schools. And so I'm pleased to say that Damien's gonna help us facilitate a course on asking that question about our hybrid programs. Are we doing what we said we would do? But I also wanted to sneak him in for a webinar as we were doing the planning for that because he told me about a research project. And Damien, I do not want to give anything away. So all I'm going to say is that you have spent 18 years looking at school mission statements. And on that, do you want to introduce yourselves and yourself and I'll share the slides and I'll mute myself and stop talking. Right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you, Peter, and welcome, everyone. It's a real privilege to, to have your, your ear and, and to be able to talk uh, about some of the research and work that we've done at Boston College and it, with other institutions uh, around purpose of school. And, you know, we sort of don't want to think of this as like a formal presentation, but I couldn't help as a research professor put some slides together. And, and so kind of the theme for today is thinking about you know, as school leaders, how do we evaluate the fidelity to mission? And, you know, thinking about what questions we should be asking. And as Sarah introduced, in this particular time and place, pretty unique, I think it's fair to say. So if we could just move forward. What I'd like to begin with is, is just this idea that we have inherited a lot of old technology in terms of pedagogy, in terms of you know, structure of schools. And, and we've seen a revolution in most of our life and you know, in the last generation of students' experience on how they access and use technology. And if anything has, has been um, notable in the last six months has been the widespread use of technology to support learning when we didn't have campus uh, open and available. And, where we sometimes forget that technology is still evolving is that in assessments and in the way we measure success has also changed. And as we see on screen, these are kind of our classical definitions of like how we measure student success, you know, the number two pencil. But this was actually an invention from the 1930s that we've sort of, you know, continued to evolve. And so if you could just advance our slide one more, Sarah. You know, I'd like to formally welcome you to, you know, this golden age of data and educational measurement. The tools that you've provided as school leaders to your students and to your teachers open massive doors and provide, you know, like this garden of data and information in terms of what student and teacher experience is and, and their perceptions and outcomes from teaching and learning. And yes, I, I see the question. We are going to make the slides available. I'm delighted to share uh, all of this work. And, and as Sarah uh, pointed out, this is actually, you know, the first time we're sharing, uh, I'm sharing some of the results of a new study. And we're, we're going to sort of get to that picture. But, you know, what's universal here is that we have this opportunity in front of us to think about the technology we, we use day in and day out to better tell our story and to provide more compelling evidence of success and provide more analytic resources. And this is particularly important 
in this time and place. And, you know, when we get together with school leaders or teachers, we just start talking about the challenges that we're facing and the uncertainties. And what I would like to suggest is that, you know, so much of not just our curriculum, but our structure of school has been challenged. And so the tools of being, a, you know, that research has used, things like surveys, drawings, analysis of, of data, you know, of, of learning management system data, an analysis of, you know, who's submitting assignments at what time, things like that provide opportunity for thinking about the whole student and, and focusing on the big picture. So if we could continue. I love this picture. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, as Sarah pointed out, we, we met under kind of this premise, sometimes I think of it like a Trojan horse, of, of looking at educational technology. And educational technology has provided me a means to be able to advance the state of the art as a data scientist. So I am not a school leader, I am not a teacher, I don't have any of that particular street cred. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna teach, you know, my research course at, at, for graduate students next week, but I don't have any of the skills or practical knowledge of, of a classroom teacher or school leader. And so I was looking at how do we advance, not just pedagogy, but how we do research. And so to do that, I focused a lot of my studies in schools that have provided a lot of technology for curricular development or for providing kids greater equity or for all kinds of other educational initiatives. And so working in those schools, I was able to sort of piggyback on those resources and think about how we capture information and use data more efficiently. And so what happened through those years of doing research, we realized like the big question was, was something that no one was asking, right? We, um, we were not addressing this, this kind of elephant in the room is what is the purpose of school, the big why, right? And so, you know, we looked at, and we found that as, as researchers, very few efforts were made to capture how schools were defining and communicating their purpose. Like they were like, you know, surveys of CEOs and, surveys of parent groups on what they thought was important in their various communities and for their stakeholders, but there was nothing for schools, which we found like kind of curious. So we went down this lion's hole of looking at school mission statements as a data artifact. And we looked at thousands of school mission statements and ended up writing a book about school mission statements and, and not just their power as a research tool, but what we found when we you know, took this analytic research approach. And, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we found there were these themes that kept coming up over and over again. And just to be clear, this is independent schools, private schools, Montessori schools, Waldorf schools, Catholic schools, Baptist schools. You know, we took, you know, we looked at every angle of American education. And then we actually started looking at different uh, aspects of global education. And overall, these are the themes that kept coming up. When schools define their purpose, these were the things we saw over and over again. And so if you want to go to the next slide, we, <laughs> being researchers, created a rubric. And, and so, you know, we could get our students, our graduate students, or our team to look at a mission statement for a given community or for a given school or for, you know, like one school out of the whole Nord Anglia family or something like that, and, and look and see what qualities are present in that mission statement with a pretty high degree of precision. So if you go to the next slide, please. Can I, let me ask you a yeah. question about this though. How long did it take to develop this rubric? I'm, I mean, I'm fascinated by this rubric and all the different pieces because I look at it and I think, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But yeah, I mean, a good school leader, you know, someone who's been like inside independent school, someone like, you know, Peter or yourself probably could have done this in like a good weekend. But as researchers, we came in like completely trying to be totally objective. And so we ended up having to like look at hundreds, thousands of mission statements over a long period of time. So we've had various, this has actually changed over time. 
We've mm -hmm. been doing this, as you pointed out, almost two decades now. And, and what that allowed us to do is, is see how things might be changing. It provided, you know, we're like old enough now. It's like we've worked in these schools and we've worked in these communities so long, we can actually start to see over the last generation of students what might be changing about this question of why? And, and wh what does that actually then mean for school leaders? And, and why is it important what, this, what it says in the mission statement? So that, that for me, um, so I guess you're, to, to answer in one sense, uh, it took a, pair, a team of researchers, Steve Stemler and myself, um, the product you see here is about 18 years in the making. Okay. Well, I'm just interested in that because you say that Peter and I could have done it in a weekend, but we would have had a lens that was not a researcher's lens, right? And so then and, and we'd exactly, have to go, so here it is. What we try to bring to the table. And, and that's, you know, I think where researchers have to walk a pretty fine line about, and being humble actually, when they're working in an educational context. Because the street cred does, I think, carry a lot of weight. And when research is done right, it helps tell that story. And so we saw this as an opportunity. Back in 2001, we took a random sample of Massachusetts high schools. That, and we applied that, a, a pretty similar version of that same coding rubric to that sample of mission statements that we collected. And we just looked at, you know, what was the most prevalent theme? What were the least prevalent themes? And I think we presented it at like a local group of, you know, educating, educator conference or something. We kind of forgot about it. And we were just hanging out not that long ago at another conference before COVID. And we thought, wow, it's been like 18 years. We're getting so old. What have we learned? It, and it occurred to us, we could go back to those same schools and their mission statements were publicly, publicly accessible and you run the same rubric and see what changed and see if there was a story there. And so I think there's a few things that kind of like seed this bigger conversation for school leaders. One is that in a typical mission statement, schools are espousing many things. So each school leader that's listening to us this afternoon or this morning, depending on your time zone, can, can like think about your mission statement and think about what are the various components that it's conveying to your community. And you know, we categorize them the way researchers might in a rubric and we'll make the slides available again for people who wanna to try to apply that rubric and we'll go much deeper when we have you know, our, our online course together. But in essence, you can just you know, on the surface look at your mission statement and, and on average, most schools were espousing between five and six themes, independent ideas in their mission statement. So you know, right from the get-go, when we think about telling our story and measuring success or, or what it is, you know, how we should be thinking about analytics and data, we often forget how broad that story needs to be to be true to the, you know, what we're putting on the front page of our website or on the inside of our office door and essentially what our parents and community are buying into. So, and, and so yeah, go ahead, please. Well, no, I have a question when I'm looking at this. And absolutely, by the way, if you are in the webinar and you've got a question, please pop it in to the Q&A. But so, Damien, it looks to me like all of the mission statements just grew, right? So, oh, let's put more stuff in because I only see one of these where the blue bar is higher than the orange bar. Does this mean that schools are trying to do more and more? And Peter can probably chime in on this a little bit as well. You know, we hear, we hear that, you know, like when our ears on the ground from a lot of schools in a lot of different contexts, right? Mm -hmm. And what our results found, like, and, and the people who are coding the mission statement didn't know, you know, we blinded it such that they didn't know, you know, which school was which, or whether it was the old mission or their updated yeah. mission. But, but, you know, one thing we found is that like 90, I think it was 99 or 98 percent of the mission statements changed, first of all. And we'd expect that in different communities, but it's kind of an assumption, right? So first of all, schools are looking at the mission and they're doing something with it. And then we stepped back and said, what are they doing with it? Well, they're growing. It's getting bigger. They're adding more themes. And as you, saw, as you see here, 
not really taking much away. And so, you know, the most prevalent themes were things like emotional <laughs> development, cognitive development, and civic development. And those continued to stay like predominant and, and the most frequent, but they all increased. So like the schools that didn't have that theme were more likely to adopt it over the last 18 years. The biggest jumps were things like challenging environment and social development, which again, like when we think about the themes of the last 20 years in our schools, and particularly this is high schools and high schools in Massachusetts, and you know, we can further narrow this down, but you know, schools are indeed adding more without taking much away based just solely on this one analytic approach using data as objectively as we could try to be. And it, it kind of tells the story, like schools are doing more, they, they mean a lot of things to their communities. And again, you know, back to this persistent question of how do we best serve our kids and teachers in the here and now, just focusing on one aspect of this wider kind of construct of what school means to you locally would be a disservice. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry to get you a little bit off topic there, but no, yeah, no, I'm on topic. I'm thinking yeah, myself. And, and so what went down with physical development, <laughs> straight? You know, I mean, yeah. which isn't a theme we see it a, a lot of. Um, it's all the way on the right of your screen for those that are looking, um, and it was kind of replaced with like career development. So whereas we saw examples of schools espousing physical development, we still see that much more frequently and elementary, primary, even middle school. But by high school, physical development is not a very frequent theme. And it, it decreased. It was one of the few things that we saw actually schools let go of mm -hmm. in, in this semester. So, mm -hmm. so I'd love to jump to the next slide because that, that provides like the alternate side of what data looks like in, in my world. And I so we do a lot of like objective you know, like how can we code this to be as analytic as possible or how can we read, you know, the Zoom data that you're already collecting to tell a story and help inform your formative needs. But ultimately, before any of that is valuable, we kind of have to know what, you know, what success looks like for you in your community and how you measure that. And, and that sometimes takes a little time to think about and catalog and sometimes just simple reflections, like this student drawing, I think this is from a third or fourth grader, can be incredibly insightful and provide a lot of value uh, to us as school leaders and as teachers as well. So can I just ask you to share, because this is something you told me that's not in here, you also have adults draw pictures. <laughs> yes. When you're doing your research. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> it's it's uh, challenging sometimes, but um, you know, we ask teachers, you know, drawing is very natural for students. And so, you know, I, I began using drawings as a research tool over 20 years ago as, as, my, as a student of Dr. Walt Haney, who had been using drawings all the way back to, um, you know, Cambodian educational uh, settings during the Vietnam War. Um, so this really long, interesting history of student drawings and we found ways as researchers where they could really help us tell a story of pedagogical change or new technologies getting integrated into the environment. They just provided this really cool data point and they helped teachers better reflect on what teaching and learning look like from their students. So it was like this win-win. And then as we started working with teachers more and working with schools around school change and around these issues of school, the, the why, We've actually had not only teachers, but school level leaders draw kind of their ideal learning environment. And we use that as like a departure point. Sometimes we'll do like a gallery walk or something formal, but if nothing else, it becomes this departure point to have a richer conversation around what we think is important. And again, that's that starting point for using data and research effectively. You have to identify there's so many things we could look at. Our mission statements typically are so broad. You know, we have to think about what's going to be important and what's going to be meaningful and start taking those small steps toward telling the story or getting the right data 
to be able to, you know, effectively um, inform that next, what's next for your school. Right. Thank you. Um, and when we get to the Q and A time, and depending on how many questions we get, well, I have more questions uh, about that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and, and so I am, you know, I'm at Boston College. Um, and if people are interested in the bigger question of some of the work we've done around mission statements, including the, the research paper that has just come out, uh, I think it's in the Journal of Social and Educational Policy. Um, we've provided it on our website. Um, you can also provide it in the chat uh, if it's helpful. I'm on ResearchGate. Almost all of the examples and articles um, I mentioned in passing are, are available free and publicly uh, there as just research articles. Um, so I, you know, enjoy getting feedback and, and continuing the conversation. All right, well, we're going to move into the Q&A, but while um, we do that, I'm going to put the links that you just mentioned in the chat as well. And um, I think one of the questions that I want to ask is, what picture would you ask a school that's needing to start remotely, right? So we can't come to campus at all. What picture should that um, school ask children to draw? And I'm thinking particularly about that age group that were the younger students, the ones we're really wondering about how is remote school going to work for them? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And you know, we've, we've used drawings in a few different ways. And where we found the most effective is, is for kids to sort of describe, you know, almost like a here and now experience. And so we were working with a school, we're collecting about a thousand drawings this week uh, from three schools in Brazil, where we use the prompt, think about your blank class. So they're making it specific to, you know, math or world geography or Portuguese in their case. Draw a picture of yourself learning in this class at home. And so what that's providing is right now that teachers are in this particular community making some assumptions about what kid learning, home learning environment looks like, how many distractions there are, do they have, what kind of space and resources they have available. And the drawings are kind of a way to get a personal approach. Now those are for schools that are sort of already in some form of remote home learning. Uh, for schools that haven't uh, stepped, you know, haven't started yet, um, we often use drawings to create kind of the ideal uh, as well and ask kids to imagine or teachers to imagine, like I mentioned before, what the ideal learning environment might look like. And that also provides as educators a lot of interesting information. Sometimes it's a little more whimsical and fantasy, which again, there's nothing wrong with. That's really fun. Um, however, even as researchers, we find that those drawings can tell us uh, you know, without even getting Freudian or anything, just looking at, the, you know, what is present and what is absent in those drawings, what are kids' learning needs or what are their perceptions of their learning needs? You know, do they need to have the, the parent in that drawing when we ask them what the ideal is? Or is the parent not there? We could look at those drawings very objectively across a classroom or a whole school and just look at, you know, who else is present or what technology might be depicted. And so that could be informative. So there's a few different directions you could go in. Um, the drawings are nice because they're so adaptable. Right. So we've got a question in the Q&A. It would seem like a natural way to check fidelity to mission is by looking at how well educational goals at the classroom level are aligned to the mission and then assessing attainment of those goals. Did you see that occur in the schools that you looked at? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really great question. And, and I think that's, you know, in some ways the crux of it. You know, when, when we've done our work, we ended up espousing a, a, a model we called the MIA model. And the M stood for mission, and that's kind of where we started. And then we would look exactly at like, what does implementation look like? And that might be going into the classroom and looking and seeing the fidelity and the match. But it might also be looking at the technology or the broader questions of scheduling or, you know, if we are a private school and we have, you know, 40% of our mission is around spiritual development, 
And there is nothing in any of our curricular maps around spiritual development and then no, you know, formal assessment for spiritual development, we see those kinds of holes. So, you know, our, our most effective cases are schools that have been reflective and have taken approaches to look more broadly across all of those domains, almost independently, like, okay, how are we addressing social learning? What is our graduate profile for this competency? Rather than, you know, looking for everything in every classroom. That is an approach, but we, we found it's almost easier to put on, again, this is like such a reductionist researcher approach. We'll look for a particular theme and evidence of that theme in different competencies, and, and then we'll follow that all the way through assessment. That's, that's so interesting. One of the exercises that, well, we, and I've over the years offered advice to schools and help to schools who are undertaking some kind of a curriculum review program. And I always ask schools to start by looking at those aspirational and foundational statements, their value statements, their mission, their core pillars, whatever they might have, but it's certainly the mission is the at the center of it. And then we ask the faculty to draw a picture, picture the graduate. So uh, I, I've got my own pictures that uh, I, I, I imagine and uh, you know how how that uh, <laughs> demonstrates what's real and what's not. And then you ask, okay, if this is the ideal graduate, what are not, what in our program supports that? And the same kind of same kind of work going on there very much. I, I'm interested a little bit in the in the, the sort of the mission creep that that uh, uh, research kind of identified. Uh, more things to be done and uh, in, in almost every school and wondering if you've had any any way of whether there is any way or whether you've looked at you know how much of that is uh, we're saying we're going to do these things because we're supposed to because the zeitgeist and the uh, accreditors just added a standard about something uh, and how much of it is this is what we truly believe we want we need to be doing and want to be doing as educators. One likes yeah. to think that's a that's a circle as a Venn diagram, but I, I wonder if it always is. Yeah, and, and and I think that's a great question. And you know, we we have examples where of, of both, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a you know a, a whole field of, of schools, you know, and how closely they live their mission. And for some, we know it's window dressing. We know it's easy just to throw one more, you know, th thing into the pot and say we're doing it because there's a marketing need or a political need. Mm -hmm. But for sustaining, you know, real educational change, they're doing themselves a disservice because there's actually some value in, in having a, a real mission and, and using it. And, and in our work, you know, we find that the implementation piece is, is usually like, pretty straightforward like we can we can work with school leaders and, and sort of connect the fidelity piece around programming and curricular offerings and student standards but then assessment gets funny you know like <laughs> when we think about assessing some of those more broad skills like the whole child things just you know people start making excuses and even schools that have these very rich broad holistic missions and are famous for that will often when they think about assessment rely on our valedictorian uh, this number of college you know you know ivies we're getting or these very traditional academic narrowly defined cognitive measures of success mm -hmm. and, and you know again it's really fun to work with schools and think about what opportunities there might be for looking at that whole child and thinking about a graduate profile that's broader than just uh, you know this accumulation of grades and cognitive ability, <laughs> and and two things kind of happen, Peter, and you've probably seen this, and I know Sarah has, but you know we've worked with some schools, and and I can name one, the Think Global School, that had such an ambitious mission statement that they found like the IB exam for their high school, for their 12th graders was simply not congruent with their broader educational mission. And not that I want to espouse like, 
you know, look so closely at your mission, you'll find that nothing fits. But in some cases, there are schools that are using like something that's traditional or off the shelves that isn't, that's actually holding them back from being that the school that they espouse to be. And so assessment is often the really, um, you know, challenge sometimes. And, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, we have to, when we're shining the flashlight, we have to, you know, keep putting batteries in our app assessment and make sure we get a good look at what schools are doing and provide them some breadcrumbs and opportunities for, for making sure that assessment as well as implementation match that, that mission. Mm -hmm. I had a request to share that slide again. So I'm gonna do it from, here we go, this one. <laughs> so I yeah. think you might be taking a <laughs> screenshot. So I just wanted to put that back up, but we will share the slides. Yeah, and, and I, I can say just one one second about this slide. This was, I believe, again, this was collected from a, a third or fourth grade student uh, in Western Michigan a year or two ago. And the prompt was very general. Draw a picture of your math class. And we see a few things just to look at this objectively. If we were a teacher or a school leader, we could look and see what kind of data, objective data, is present in this drawing. And, and we would look at things and we create a rubric, Sarah, as you might imagine, where we could code things like, is the teacher present or not? Yes or no? Is, are the students engaged? Is one or more student engaged? Are the desks in rows? Are the kids collaborating? Just a series of things that a teacher or a school leader would look at a drawing and, you know, check off very quickly. Is it present or absent? And if you had a class of set or a school set, you could very quickly look at patterns and trends and see, you know, 80% of our math classes have the teacher present and talking at the front of the board room. 30% mm -hmm. um, of our math classes show kids collaborating um, and things like that. And that was the kind of work we were doing. But the individual drawing the kids create also is really insightful and powerful. So forgetting about the power of, you know, being an objective data point the individual drawing can often give us a lot of insight and clarity on what it's like to be in that classroom. And this is classic because you have that student in the back who's having a <laughs> fairly different experience than the kid who sits at the front of the room. And any of us who spent any time in a fourth grade math class has seen this. Well, and I feel like that's the child who drew the picture. Well, I, <laughs> we are... About out of time, I just want to remind everyone, I dropped into the chat the link to the research paper. Here's um, Damien's website, The Purpose of School. And then I just want to add, if you would like to hear more of Damien's work and how this, how this sort of is playing out both for the right now and as we move into the future. You know, what are the moments and the data points that we don't want to miss capturing because we want the, to help them to help us inform what we do next. So Damien, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Thank you thank so you much. It was, it was, it went by quickly. And again, uh, you know, I look forward to the opportunity of engaging in the online experience and rolling up our sleeves and, and getting to talk about some of these issues in even more detail. And, you know, when we, when we put it in the context of schools, it becomes, you know, of an individual school, it really becomes, it moves from the theory to being like, wow, this is really helpful and powerful in the here and now. So research can be our friend. Great. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, Bye. Thanks.